Evening everyone and welcome to our St. Louis Children's Hospital Facebook Live Ask the Experts Back to School and the COVID-19 Vaccine. I'm Mike Boldhouse and uh, I would like to start this evening by introducing our two participants and experts for uh, tonight's event. Uh, with me, I have Drs. Rachel Orschlin and Dr. Jason Newland, both of whom are Washington University Pediatric Infectious Disease Specialists at St. Louis Children's Hospital. And uh, we're going to get going here. We've got a lot to tackle tonight. Um, a lot of good questions have already come in. I, I'm sure that a lot more will get submitted during the broadcast. We probably won't have time for all of them, but we have made an effort to uh, really kind of put a circle around a lot of the ones that have come in repeatedly multiple times from folks. So uh, we're going to get going here in just a, just a minute. Uh, first, I want to just kind of set some expectations for the evening. So uh, first of all, before we really get into to, to the meat of this, um, you know, obviously there's there's been a lot of discussion about how uh, the the pandemic has certainly impacted uh, kids and their families, uh, teens in particular. Uh, I think from a, a you know stress and, and, and mental and behavioral health. And so wanted to start out by just putting in a, a quick plug for uh, a resource that is available to uh, parents of teens in particular uh, to uh, connect with St. Louis Children's Hospital. That is uh, 314-454-TEENS. Um, that is a resource that is available uh, for mental and behavioral health for Missouri and Illinois families. It's staffed by professionals from uh, the St. Louis Children's Psychology Department, open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So um, again, 4514 um, is an option for, for you know, families who uh, continue to to deal with the adverse uh, effects of the pandemic. And so just wanted to put that out there as we get started tonight. So um, what we're prepared to talk to tonight and provide some guidance on and, and what, you know, some of the things that we're not, uh, definitely want to answer, you know, general questions. As always, things that are, you know, incredibly specific to your situation, your child um, are obviously best addressed by you know, your, your child's physician. Um, but this, this is focused in almost exclusively on the vaccine's impact on the school year. Um, other areas like masking, quarantining, learning pods, things like that, uh, maybe something we come back and address closer into you know, the school year. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is, you know, we're we're waiting on just like you know most or all of you at this point, waiting on guidelines from you know state and local school boards about you know what that might look like as the school year approaches. Um, also, want to point out that you know vaccine appointments can be scheduled for you and your child through bjc.org/coronavirus or vaccinatestl.org among you know other doctors' offices, pharmacies, et cetera. Uh, and I believe that there will be a, a, a list of vaccine location resources in the comments section. Um, but with those things in mind, I uh, wanted to kick this off by, again, just kind of opening it up to both Dr. Orschlin and Dr. Newland for some opening remarks. And then you know, Dr. Orschlin has prepared um, uh, some information to walk us all through before we get into the Q&A. So as we get into this, uh, Dr. Orschel and Dr. Newland, any kind of opening comments, general comments about kind of where we sit at this point in time with, with uh, the return to school just a little over a month away for most folks? Well, I think that it's important to note that we're experiencing a surge in cases. Uh, we've all watched what's happened in Southwest Missouri and the Springfield area, and it's even more dire than uh, we, thought it would be as of today when the we've learned that their head of their county health departments asking for more resources to set up a transition care facility because they're overrun. Um, and we don't want to see that in our area. And we have seen a surge in our own cases. And we've seen a surge in hospitalizations that have been doubled to possibly tripled in the past two weeks. And a simple solution, though it's not as simple as we would like, is vaccination. And so I'm very fortunate to work with such um, awesome people here at St. Louis Children's, one of them being my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Orschlin, who I think we're lucky to hear some of her uh, great insights uh, with the presentation she has. So thanks so much for tuning in uh, tonight. And I'm just gonna go over a brief overview of the vaccine and then we'll get into questions that people have submitted. Uh, I'll take the next one. So just by way of background information, um, when we talk about a vaccine, that's basically a way that we can stimulate the immune system against a specific infection and protect an individual against a, uh, a specific infection without having to experience that infection. 
So vaccines can be made in a variety of different ways. Some vaccines are made by using a weakened or killed virus. There are other ways that vaccines are developed. But it is important to note that the current vaccines that we have that are available for children do not contain any live virus. So one important point is that you cannot get COVID-19 from this vaccine. Next slide, please. So when we receive a vaccine or when we experience an infection, um, basically what happens is that our body um, sees the virus, the virus actually enters our cells. And one unique thing about viruses is that they actually can't replicate on their own. They actually require the host cell to make copies of themselves. And so they use their genetic material and they use your cell to create multiple copies. When this happens, the immune system is actually stimulated against certain elements of the virus um, to produce antibodies. And there are also other cells called T cells and other immune cells that um, interact with these um, proteins. And when that happens, your body learns how to make antibodies. So the next time you see the infection, you don't get sick. Um, I can tell you that the current vaccine that's currently available for children to protect against COVID-19 um, is um, called a messenger RNA vaccine. And how this kind of vaccine works is that it takes a little, um, basically a little fat bubble or a little lipid bubble that contains a tiny amount of information that codes for the spike protein, which is the important part of the virus that our immune system responds to. And so when a person receives the vaccine, their body is sort of tricked into making the spike protein without being infected with the virus. And that way you can develop antibodies much like you would if you had a natural infection. Next slide, please. So one important point to make about the vaccine is that none of the steps that are used to develop a vaccine typically have been skipped in this process. So some people wonder, you know, how are we able to do this so rapidly? And there's a couple of answers to that, one of which is money. So, you know, in this particular situation, because we were in a public health crisis, this pandemic, um, there was sort of unlimited funds available for developing this vaccine. There were also many people who were willing to volunteer. So all the current phases that we use for vaccine development took place for this particular vaccine. Another uh, important point is that when you're trying to determine if a vaccine is going to be effective, you need to have events occur or illnesses occur so you can tell the difference between a person who's been vaccinated and a person who's received placebo or sort of a saline injection. And when you have lots of people who are experiencing the infection in the community, you're able to easily tell uh, within a relatively short period of time whether that vaccine is effective in preventing the infection. Next slide, please. So, you know, when we look at the number of volunteers that were uh, um, present in this particular study and compare that to other studies of vaccines that are currently available, you can see for the Pfizer vaccine, for the Moderna vaccine, and for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, tens of thousands of adults um, participated in these clinical trials. Next slide, please. One of the most amazing things about these clinical trials is that we really saw that they had very good efficacy. I think you may remember when the vaccine trials were being rolled out that you know there was a hope that the vaccines would receive emergency use authorization if they were greater than 50% effective. And we were really, really pleased and impressed and surprised and uh, to find out that the vaccines had much higher efficacy in preventing infection. And what has been even more remarkable is the degree to which that all the available vaccines protect against the most severe outcomes. None of us really wants to get a cold. None of us wants to have an infection. But what we really want to protect against for ourselves, for our families, and for our communities is severe disease and death. And so um, the vaccines we have are nearly 100% um, effective in preventing severe disease and death and hospitalization when people receive uh, the full series and are at least two weeks from that series. Next slide. So the current vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, both have emergency use authorization. And that has been extended also into the pediatric age group for the Pfizer vaccine down to age 12. And this particular clinical trial really utilized adolescents and they weren't even clear that they were going to have enough data to prove efficacy. But what we were going to look at was, do these vaccines produce the same sort of immune response in adolescents? But it was 
remarkable that in the clinical trial that involved adolescents, in those children who received the vaccine, no child experienced the infection, whereas there were 16 cases uh, in the placebo group. So in this particular clinical uh, trial, it was 100% effective in preventing infection in adolescents who received the vaccine. Next slide, please. So, you know, you have heard likely in the news media of cases occurring in people who are vaccinated. And that's because all, none of the vaccines is 100% effective in um, preventing infection. And so if you have a 90 or a 95% reduction in chance, that means you still continue to have a small chance of infection with each encounter you have with an infectious individual. And that's why it's so important for everyone to be vaccinated because we're all safer if we have fewer encounters with infectious individuals because our risk of infection adds up over time if we are continually encountering infectious individuals. Next slide, please. So we know when we compare the vaccinations to uh, infection that the safety really falls on the side of vaccination. Um, we have a number of ways that we monitor for vaccine safety. Um, one of those is through the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, and anybody can report um, a condition that occurs after vaccine to VAERS. Now, just because something's reported in VAERS does not mean that it is causally related or that the vaccine caused that event, but it's a way that we can collect information. And I can tell you this particular vaccine has more safety data, more follow-up than we have on many vaccines because of the number of people who've been vaccinated and the surveillance that's been done. We have detected some adverse events and that is expected anytime you roll out a new medication or vaccine. And so it's important to compare what is the risk of any adverse event related to the vaccine compared to if you become infected. People need to understand that with this widespread uh, viral infection in the community, most, if not all, people will ultimately be infected. And so we want to compare what's our risk um, if we get infected compared to our risk if we receive the vaccine. For adolescents, a recent risk uh, that has been that has been reported in the news media and was reported by the CDC is in the FDA is myocarditis. Now, this is a condition where there is some inflammation of the heart can result in some chest pain, um, elevated um, enzymes, and most cases resolved spontaneously or with very little intervention. There's no known long-term effectiveness. And we saw that there were some of these cases of myocarditis, particularly in young boys age 16 and above. But if we compare the risk of an adverse event related to um, uh, uh, having the natural infection, we know that the risk of hospitalization, the risk of ICU admission, the risk of death um, is higher for the infection. We also see multi-system inflammatory syndrome of childhood. This is a rare complication uh, in pediatric patients who had no clinical infection. And we see those cases occurring after infection, uh, about 316 cases per million. And that often involves heart inflammation. So when you compare the risk of having a, a minor and self-limited um, side effect compared to what will uh, the risk of the infection, we see that the risk of infection is much higher. And the CDC and the ACIP um, have all come out in support of vaccination uh, for children and adolescents. So I think that is my last slide. And now we could move on to the question. Of course I did that. I mean, we talked about this before, Mike. I mean, come on. We did. We did. And yet I fell victim to it. So uh, good for me. Um, well, hey, uh, that was precious time wasted on my part because by, by my uh, by my count, we have uh, 17 questions that uh, represent the most common questions. There's a bunch more and then there's already some coming in. So uh, it's going to be a bit of a sprint. So we're going to we're going to jump right into it. Um, the first batch of questions um, are kind of related to either directly or indirectly um, the Delta variant, which is, of course, the, the variant that is, is, you know, kind of at the forefront of the news cycle right now. Um, so the first question, uh, Dr. Newland, um, what would you tell someone who says kids only represent a small percentage of those infected and or hospitalized due to COVID, a non-approved FDA vaccine doesn't seem worth it? Uh, it is worth it. 
uh, the, the vaccine, while kids are thankfully, let's all be clear, thankfully, have not been as severely impacted as our adults and our elderly. Um, there are other uh, complications, such as multisystem inflammatory syndrome, over 4,000 cases. There is complication. So, yes, thankfully, it is mild. And thankfully, our kids have done well. So that's one reason. Now, like, why should we even have them even potentially get a rare complication? Um, additionally, our children live with loved ones, um, and our loved ones could be at higher risk. Um, not could be, likely can are at higher risk for severe disease. These loved ones could be people that have undergone transplantations. Our medical system's amazing. They, we can do lung transplants, heart transplants, bone marrow transplants. We can keep people alive that have very bad immune systems. Now, the problem is, is that because of their immune systems, often they might not re have the same response to a vaccine that you, me, our children have. And so having more people that are, you know, have a better response to vaccine around them protects them even further. So I, I heard this um, and I just think it's, I think, frankly, if we get our children vaccinated and add that to the percentages that we need to get to, which frankly, we're not even close with our adults, we will be able to do what we did in 2019, or we will get to do like what they're doing in some of the other states where they've reached 80% vaccinations, where it's almost like for real that they can feel like the COVID-19 isn't as much a player like it is here today, and that we're gonna continue experience unless we increase our vaccination. Thank you. Uh, next question, Dr. Orschelin. Um, if, you're, if your child has had, it's, I think it's if your child has had COVID or has had COVID, um, is the vaccine necessary? Do the antibodies from the illness do the same thing as a vaccine? How long does the vaccine last? <laughs> Those are great questions. Um, you know, there is some protection that people have after having natural infection. In careful studies, it may be about 80% protection against um, infection in the few months after you have that infection. Um, but we know that people, those antibodies wane and that people do get reinfected with some of the viral variants. And so um, receiving the vaccine provides a greater level of protection, a longer level of protection. And it also provides protection against the need to quarantine. You do have some relief from quarantine after a documented infection for about three months. But after the vaccine, there isn't a time limit after which you don't, uh, where you will need to quarantine, at least at this current moment. Our current data suggests that the um, vaccine-specific antibodies last for at least nine months, if not longer. And investigators at Washington University also documented that there have been these very robust T cell responses, which likely indicate that we will have um, a longer duration of protection against um, infection after vaccination. And, and there's some notion, I don't know, Rachel, you know what your feeling is, but there is some notion that you know, adding vaccine that, you know, our vaccines seem, those vaccinated seem to be responding potentially better to the variants and that natural infection plus vaccine, you're likely protected against what the next variant's gonna be. Cause mind you, right? We talked about the alpha variant, that's when Michigan was on fire. And now we're talking about the Delta variant when Missouri's on fire, there is going to be another variant. I don't know what it's gonna be, Zeta, what, I don't know what letter they're gonna have next, but there's a chance, and there's a good chance, the vaccinations are going to make you better protected than if you had natural infection with one of these other ones. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Newland, this one's back to you. Um, if an unvaccinated adult has contracted COVID-19 and tested positive for antibodies, can they still become infected, carry, or transmit the Delta variant? Um, so in thinking about this question, I'm... I'm assuming that this individual potentially is asking if I am positive and that I have gone through my infectious period, which is 10 days, and now I am beyond the infectious period. So I'm to say like I'm a month later after being infected with Delta. Um, can I now pass it? The answer is no, if that's the question, because we don't think of you being carriers. You're not a carrier. You, you get it. You get over it you move on. Now, of course, we do know that in certain populations, your infectious period is longer. That's in immunocompromised or severe illness in hospital. And I should say it's really in hospital, but you are not carrying it later on. 
Uh, Rachel, Dr. Orson, do you have anything else to add? I mean, did I get that how you interpreted <laughs> that? Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely correct. You know, once you recover from the illness, you, you can, people have been reinfected. And if you have a positive test, sometimes it's hard because you can detect some of the viral material in the nasal passages for a period of time. But typically that wouldn't be considered infectious material. Um, and so we don't think that people transmit outside of the circumstances you outlined. But once you're getting three months out from your infection, then we think you may be susceptible again. And that's why there is the need to quarantine after an exposure if you've recovered from an infection, but it's been greater than three months. Yeah, and, and you're unvaccinated. And, and you're unvaccinated. And you're under, because the vaccination, you're like Dr. Orson, myself, Mike, we're all vaccinated. So, man, that's that's one of the beauties, right? Like, I, if we're exposed, we need to monitor symptoms, but don't have to quarantine. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Orson, uh, this is coming back to the kids. How does the Delta variant manifest itself in young children? I have heard that the symptoms are more severe. If so, in what way? How are they different? I don't know that there's great data that there's really a difference in pre presentation in kids with any of the variants. I mean, sometimes people will say, oh, more people have sore throat. Sometimes there's some concern about more severe illness. I'm not sure that there's great evidence that there's really more severe illness, although we know when more people get infected, we often see um, people being hospitalized at a greater rate. And certainly if healthcare resources are strapped, we see people doing more poorly, which is why we want to prevent that from happening in our community. But there's not a significant difference in clinical presentation with the Delta variant in kids or adults um, compared to the prior variants. Thank you. Um, next question. This is still on Delta variants. Uh, Dr. Newland, what, what are the precautions? Are there any, I guess it's, are there any special precautions for the Delta variant? Um, in addition, you know, they're saying, uh, in addition to those we took to protect ourselves from the first wave or two, or two waves of, of COVID-19, they're asking about, is there a different type of mask someone should wear or things like that? Are there anything that people should be doing differently to protect against the variants? Uh, no, uh, do what we've learned. Uh, and, I, and I just can say we want to talk about vaccination. Let's make sure we're vaccinating and supporting vaccination. Um, we know that that works. That works against Delta variant. Um, all the vaccines are incredible. I mean, that these vaccines are incredible. I, we would have, if somebody would have told us at the beginning of the pandemic, we were going to have two vaccines that had a 95% effectiveness and then would continue to remain almost similarly effective after you had variants, we would be like, you are kidding me. I don't know way that's the case. So just know they are that effective. So that's one. Number two is mask, distance, stay home when you're sick. These things still work. I mean, it, it's still the same premise. Um, and, and, you know, if you're going to get in a large gathering with a bunch of people that are unvaccinated, you're, you're asking for some trouble if you're not wearing masks, you're not thinking of the distancing and that that's in place. Um, now, yes, we've learned outdoors is way better than indoors. Um, and so you're going to go to a Cardinals game and you're vaccinated, have fun. You're going to go to a Cardinals game, be outside, you're unvaccinated. Okay, yeah, you're probably a little safer without the mask on and with 40,000 of your best friends, but you know, you you you're you're at a much greater risk than the person that's vaccinated sitting there. So, these are the things we have to take into account. It's you guys are smart people, you know this. This is what we've learned and I think that's the same thing with Delta. Uh, it's it hasn't changed and I, I can tell you as I've mentioned, the other variants that are coming, it's that the mitigation strategies will continue to be the same with number one that we have that will get us out of this sooner is vaccination. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to come right back to you for this one, Dr. Newman. So uh, there's a lot of attention and a lot of focus, um, and we're moving on a little bit to vaccine safety and, and testing as a kind of general category. Uh, there's a lot of interest, obviously, because we're dealing with a, a you know, school-aged population for which currently there are vaccines for some of them, but but the younger crowd not yet. So there's a lot of interest in when will the uh, the five to eleven year old age group become vaccine eligible? When do we expect uh, the the emergency use use authorization for the, the the vaccines for that age group to to become uh, uh, active? Yeah. So first off everyone should know that the two vaccines that will get approved eventually for the less than 12 year olds will be pfizer first then moderna so that that's how that's johnson and johnson will not have a younger age group in this country that will those trials will not be conducted pfizer's vaccine has from what we know has completed enrollment for this age group um, they are likely in their follow-up period, which typically will be about two months. 
one will say if they're doing a lot of uh, have a lot of participants in our part of the country, that's somewhat good because they will have more infected of the placebo. The plan is that that data should be available by September. That was reported by Pfizer at back in April. I, you know, everyone has a different bet when this is going to happen. You guys can all tell me I was wrong later, or you can even tell me I was right later if I'm <laughs> right, um, which is I think October. Um, Hopefully October that our that age of this Moderna will not be available. I, I don't think until 2022. We are at Washington University and St. Louis Children's Hospital. We are a part of these the vet Moderna vaccine trial. Um, we are in the midst of this. Um, and and just so you know, like that, that it's ongoing, but it likely won't be approved until 2022. Thank you very much. I know that that was a, uh, a very popular question. Uh, Dr. Orschelin, uh, what's the recommendation of spacing of COVID vaccines with flu vaccines, HPV vaccines, or other other vaccines that are typically required for, for school age kids? Well, the really good news is that there is no recommendation to space the vaccine. So you can actually give them at the same time as routine childhood illness uh, vaccines or before or after without regard to any spacing. When the vaccines were originally rolled out, they did make this recommendation for spacing. And I think that's primarily to be able to um, detect reactions to any vaccination, um, which are common. You know, people have sore arm, people have um, low grade fever sometimes, maybe some muscle aches. Um, but that recommendation is now that you can have the vaccine at any time in relation to other childhood vaccinations. Thank you. Um, and then, I, I guess I'm going to make this a toss up for, for either one of you. Maybe both have uh, have something to say about this, but there's uh, it's an interesting question uh, in that <laughs> the question is, isn't having a complication from the vaccine worse than getting COVID? So I think I would say no. I mean, certainly nobody wants to have a side effect of a vaccine, you know, but again, most side effects of the vaccine are going to be relatively short lived and minor and um, more serious complications are going to be very rare. And uh, when you have the natural infection, your risk of having uh, a complication is actually much higher. There was actually an interesting study that was done in college athletes. And are college athletes exactly like every other teenager? I do not know, there may be a difference. But in this particular study, they did very careful cardiac follow-up on these athletes. And I, I don't remember the total number, Jason may know of athletes that were enrolled in this study, but in this study, they found evidence of heart inflammation in about 2.3% of the athletes. That's a pretty high rate of complication. Now they weren't all symptomatic, about 0.6% were symptomatic. But that's still a much higher number of people that were affected in terms of cardiac involvement compared to the small um, number that we saw with the vaccine. And, and I think that the outcome, I mean, the 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 outcomes, um, well, we don't want anybody to have side effects, but the outcomes of, of illness can be quite severe, um, quite severe. And these, you know, and, and death happens from COVID-19. Death happens from COVID-19. Um, at not an inconsequential um, rate for both adults. And, and again, while thankfully children have not been impacted, again, over 400 deaths um, and possibly more um, as we move through into the next surges, especially among some of our most vulnerable pediatric populations, those with underlying conditions and such. We also see kids have, you know, kind of like a chronic fatigue-like illness um, that can last for months and be waxing and waning, even if they weren't significantly ill with the initial infection. We see adolescents that have loss of taste or smell that's persistent, uh, that really impacts their ability and enjoyment to eat and even can result in weight loss. So we see, um, you know, again, children are at low risk. They're not at no risk. Uh, my One of my favorite podcasts, This Week in Virology. Um, but uh, so we do, when we have an effective tool for preventing infection, we really want to look risk benefit ratio and it really does fall down on the side of the vaccination being very beneficial, very safe for preventing severe illness. And, and I just want to add one thing is that, you know, I think what Dr. Orslan's laid out with, you know, with her presentation and stuff is that we have so many systems in place to monitor the safety of this vaccine. I mean, there is, as was mentioned in the presentation, just the trials leading up to this, there was way more than many other vaccines that we're so commonly used to getting. And remember that we have a system in place. There's, you know, this V-safe system specifically for COVID-19. There are hundreds of millions of doses that have been given and follow-up has been done. Like, 
we're talking about the one in a million things. This is like walking outside right now in this thunderstorm and potentially getting hit by lightning. I mean, that's what we're talking about right now. So I think we have been so incredibly blessed with this vaccine. And while yes, there are side effects and yes, that, but it is rare. And the benefits, the benefits as we think about where we are today, are so, so outweigh the risk. Thank you both. Um, another question that I think we all heard um, in our own daily lives as, as one of these you know, primary concerns for people about the vaccines. Uh, Dr. Orslin, will the vaccine cause infertility down the line? No, there's no evidence that this vaccine or any vaccine has any impact on fertility. And there's really not a biological mechanism where that would happen. The vaccine, when it's given into the arm, like other vaccines, is, you know, stimulates the immune system for a brief period of time. And then the vaccine itself is degraded. We know that these vaccines actually require very careful storage. So the vaccine is degraded and you're left with your response to the spike protein. People have to remember when you get infected, with the viral infection, your immune system is responding to many components of the virus, but to the spike protein, there's not a difference. We have no evidence that there's been an impact on fertility um, in any patient population, either with the natural infection or with vaccination. Thank you. Um, we bumped up against this one a few minutes ago, uh, but it is it is another question that's on the list here. and. It uh, looks like it's coming in um, through the through the live chat as well. Uh, it's the notion of FDA approval, and, and just want to go back and hit on this again because the question is: there's a lot of people who are feeling it's just it just feels safer. Maybe it's psychological or whatever the case may be. It just feels safer to wait until the FDA has formally approved uh, these vaccines. Uh, Dr. Newland, how would how would you care to respond to that? Well, we have an emergency use evaluation. Um, or excuse me, authorization. And I think people are, what people are referring to is full licensure of the vaccine. Now that application has been submitted to the FDA. Um, that's being reviewed. I, I, I think that that's probably come out. I think our experience and our experiences and the data that we continue to follow closely, um, minute by minute, uh, would, I mean, minute by minute, right? Like when myocarditis appeared, people knew Within, within within hours to weeks. I mean, it was very, very quick. Um, and, and I would say that um, with the trials that we have seen with children, I mean, let's also be clear, this weren't approved until, I should say, given emergency youth authorization, until we had trials completed with thousands of children being able to end these trials. And that's why we don't have it for the younger kids, despite the fact that we've been asked, hey, can I get my 10-year-old vaccinated? Really, can I please get them vaccinated? And we're like, no, you can't. We need to make sure. While I hear people say, well, I feel much better if it's licensed, there is nothing that we have with millions of doses given, even to our children, that says that it is not safe. And while I understand people at this point says, I just would like to see the licensure, and, and I respect that, but I can tell you as a pediatric infectious disease physician who has three children that are vaccine eligible, they were all receiving their vaccines at the time because of the science that was used to develop it, the science that was used to study the actual administration of it, and the follow-up that has continued to be ongoing. And so therefore, I don't think we need full licensure to be giving the vaccine to this population of, of children. And I'll just say, make a few follow-up points to that. Um, I totally agree. And, you know, the longer you wait to be vaccinated is the, in, you know, time, increased time that you're susceptible to the infection. So your risk period is just prolonged when you delay vaccination. The second point is, I think, you know, people may uh, be aware that vaccines, when there is an adverse event associated with a vaccine, and it can happen with any vaccine or medication, those typically happen in a period of time after the vaccine. Um, so people can have an acute allergic reaction um, to the vaccine. We see that very rarely, five or six cases per million. And then people can have a uh, sort of a um, unhelpful immune response that happens rarely. That is associated with your when your um, immune response is actually peaking. So we 
don't see effects that emerge after vaccination, really after two months after vaccination. So we have a lot of data on patients who are at least two months out from their vaccine. And we've seen um, the um, adverse events that we've mentioned. There have been rare adverse events in uh, um, subsets of the population, but we don't really need longer data to be assured that it's safe. Well, it's it's interesting too because I have to remind myself sometimes I have the great benefit of working alongside folks like you and and have access to some of the questions that that I know a lot of people have and uh, just the the last follow up I'll, I'll put on this is that I have to remind myself it's it, it's not a lot of people spend time with the FDA approval process right so <laughs> so so the follow up question is um, what is taking so long. Or, 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 you know, at least the perception of what's taking so long. Well, the 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 beauty about our system is they look at every piece of data. I mean, they 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 don't they don't take the company saying, hey, you should approve it. They look at every piece of data, which is which is great. We have a great system, um, but there is nothing in the tea leaves that would suggest it's not going to be approved. Or and you've seen, I mean, you've seen the responses to how our how our public health responds when there's an adverse event. Right, Johnson and Johnson, you see potentially life-threatening clots. They stop. They stop giving. Now that there's a, de- a whole debate about whether they should have or shouldn't have, whatever. But the positives that came out of that was you have a system in our country that says we're not going to let people be given things that aren't safe. So I don't know what else. I mean, I think we are in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic. We are currently in the in the state that is one of the hot spots with a part of our region. And I'm gonna say, look, our state, the state of Missouri in Illinois, like right now, if you're in Illinois, you're you're in the lucky side, um, but it's not far from you. But we have a part where they're, they are experiencing the worst part of the pandemic that they've experienced since the beginning. They're talking about building other things because they don't have enough places for, for, for sick people, which means, which means that if, one of your loved ones that lives in Springfield, Missouri area comes in with, let's say, like a boating accident because they were out on Table Rock having a blast, which can happen. They might not have a place to care for them. They might not have a bed for them, something that that could be cared for. And we have the mechanisms to prevent that, which is masking, distancing, don't go out sick. And most importantly, an effective highly highly effective and very very safe vaccine i that so i just and i think we know that and we've seen that and that's why i feel so passionate about it understood thank you uh this is a this is kind of a long and winding question so i'm going to try and parse it because i think we've covered pieces of it but what what they're really what the the person's really getting at here it looks like is um are there different rules for vaccinated and unvaccinated children What's the benefit of a non-vaccinated child wearing a mask if both vaccinated and non-vaccinated can spread the virus, as I understand it? Dr. Orslin, you want to take a crack at that? Well, we know that pe- when people are vaccinated, they have a much lower chance of spreading infection. Now, anybody who becomes infected can spread the infection, but it's much, they're first much less likely to become infected at all, and then they're less likely to be able to spread that. We know people have less virus when they do become infected. Um, but people, it is important if people have an exposure, even if they're vaccinated, to monitor for symptoms and be tested if they develop symptoms. Um, but the vaccines are highly effective, so masks may not be necessary in all situations for people who are fully vaccinated, and the CDC has made guidance on that. Now, when you're in a situation, uh, if you want to remember the slide I had where when you're seeing lots of people in the community who are infected and you might encounter those infectious people repeatedly, that's a circumstance where masks may be indicated even for vaccinated individuals. Crowded areas in situations where there's a very high level of community transmission, certainly if they're individuals who feel more comfortable in a mask, Uh, people who may not have responded as well to the vaccine, older individuals. Um, These are situations where you might consider wearing a mask even if you're vaccinated. Dr. Newland? The only thing I'd add to this, and and, and hopefully this will add to the actual question, is the one thing that we're learning, especially right now during our surge, I know I keep going back to the surge, is that among those people in the hospital, 95 to 99% are unvaccinated, right? So of the, the vaccinated people that happen to have the quote unquote breakthrough infection, they're at home. They're not they're not ended up in the hospital. They're not ended up in the intensive care unit having a breathing tube. 
I mean, that's that is clearly what we continue to hear over and over. And as we continue to do some of our testing work, I mean, it is it's 99 percent unvaccinated individuals who are getting sick right now. So I, I don't I think we have to take into account that one of the beauties of this vaccine has also been that those who have got had a breakthrough infection are probably being extremely because I can flat out tell you there are some that have, are I would like, oh, wow, if you weren't vaccinated, you're definitely in an ICU right now. There is no doubt it has made a dramatic impact in serious infection. Thank you. Um, before we move to the next section where we're starting to get into some some more kind of at school, school based questions, uh, I do know it sounds like there's a lot of questions coming in on on masking in the chat. And I know at the very top we, we talked about uh, some of that is kind of up in the air and, and to be determined as we get closer to the school year. A lot of it will be determined, be determined by policies with the school boards. So we're going to kind of steer away from that for just a, a little bit here, and we are going to focus on some of these questions that are that are yet to be asked about you know, kind of the school based questions. This one um, is let, let's let's go with you, Dr. Newland, for this one. How likely is an in-person school and sports teenager unvaccinated to spread COVID-19 or the Delta variant to vaccinated family members? And then the, the kind of aside here is um, if the unvaccinated teen is masked, will it help keep transmission low or not at all? So um, the probability of an unvaccinated giving it to a vaccinated in a household um, is, I don't know the number, but what I can tell you is that where we're seeing a lot of the vaccinated people getting sick is when they get an unvaccinated person into their house. I mean, the house households are where transmission primarily is occurring. So I think this is where, you know, uh, those of you who have the children that are in this unvac the not eligible for vaccine is, you know, especially now as we're seeing the surge in cases, that's something to be keep in mind that that's where the masks come into play. That's where not go being around people that are sick and don't let your child be out when they're sick. That's where that protection is needed, um, especially as we're seeing the surge. But, you know, if you have someone that's unvaccinated in your home and you're vaccinated, yeah, you have a risk of getting COVID-19. We've seen it. It's less. It's much less. If you had a bunch of, if everybody's unvaccinated in the home, I can promise you everybody in the household at this point in time, at least what we're seeing with the Delta variant is probably almost all of them are going to get it. I mean, that's at least been our experience so far. Uh, Dr. Orschlin, got anything? No, there? I think I think you said it all. I, masks help. Um, so if you have an unvaccinated teenager and they're participating in activities, it's important for them to wear masks. Um, uh, but the risk is much lower for people who are vaccinated. Uh, Dr. Orschlin, let's go back to you for this one. There have been clusters and outbreaks at kids' summer camps. Uh, it says, will that happen at school too? Or I guess maybe the question is, how likely is that to happen at school? Well, you know, everything depends on our human behavior. We know we are tired of the pandemic. Uh, many of us are. And we know how this viral infection spreads and we know how to prevent it. So when, uh, when there are lapses, you have a susceptible population um, and there is an infectious person that enters that environment, you can see cases occurring. That's why it's really important to follow the mitigation strategies that Dr. Newland has outlined, particularly when you're talking about unvaccinated children and particularly when you're talking about high levels of community transmission. That's the situation we're in. We know we can operate schools safely. We know the types of strategies that have been successful, and that's not gonna change going into the fall, um, regardless of what the variant is in circulation. The best thing we can do as a community is to try to drive down rates of community transmission, and vaccination is one way that we can do that, both for the community, but also for the school population. The more people that are vaccinated within the school community, the less likely any infectious part will be able to find a susceptible host. Sure, thank you. Uh, this is a question from a teacher. Um, teacher is asking, can an adult who has been vaccinated with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine receive a Pfizer or Mod uh, Moderna booster? What do we know about boosters? Dr. Millen, you want to? Yeah, so, um, you know, right now the recommendation is we don't need a booster, though obviously we've heard in the past couple of weeks a lot of conversation about that. Now, I think we need to, I like us to step back and think, what does a booster mean, right? When we say the word booster, what we're assuming is that, you know, we're going to have this lack of protection because our immunity 
will go less. Like, so we always talk about antibody levels in this. If you have natural infection after three months, you, you know, you have less antibody levels. As Dr. Orslan mentioned, you know, there's some work done here right at Washington University that says, look, you actually get a really good T cell memory response. So that's part of your immune system. And it's just like it says, you got some memory. So it's kind of like, oh, look, oh, that's COVID-19 in my body. Ah, I'm, I need to wake up and go attack it. That's not found by antibody. So we don't really know yet if you need a booster and or if you're ever quote unquote going to need a booster, maybe. I think more likely, this is my personal opinion, we might need another vaccine because of a variant. We get a variant that escapes our vaccine more. Maybe that's a little bit both. It's a variant that gives you a boost because yeah, now that's kind of what we do with influenza every year. Now we'll see, it's still yet, to, it's gonna play out. But specifically now to your question, right now there's no recommendation that you need to have another, you know, that you should go get Pfizer or you should go get Moderna because it's a different mechanism. Now there's a lot of studies out there in other parts of the world where they are kind of um, evaluating if you mix and match vaccines and there's other patient populations like immunocompromised where they're talking about potentially adding another vaccine that has a different mechanism. So just like you're suggesting. So there is work being done, which I think is awesome, right? Because it will handle all populations. But for you specifically, no, you're you're great with J&J. &J. It's also a fantastic vaccine um, that's, you know, it, it having the similar effectiveness um, that we're seeing with Pfizer and Moderna. Thank you. I'm going to ask a couple questions back to back here that are that are related. They also, I would file these under things I think I know the answer to, but probably shouldn't even I venture a guess. I think you should try to answer it, Mike. I no, no. You know what? I don't think that would be good for anybody, um, oh, at least call okay. me. So, so, uh, but we're more, more, more worried about the people watching this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to you guys. Uh, so the the first one is, should I keep my child out of school if they are unvaccinated? And then the second one is, should I keep my child out of school if they had, if they have unvaccinated siblings? or if we live with adults that don't or can't have the vaccine? Well, I can start with that. You know, the decision, um, you know, obviously is a personal one for families regarding um, whether or not they send their child to in-person learning. We know that we can operate in-person learning safely with the mitigation strategies in place. Uh, Dr. Newland did some really fabulous studies looking at the potential for transmission in school, even looking with um, viral testing, not just picking up kids who were symptomatic. And we saw very little evidence. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that being in person in the school environment with mitigation strategies in place is a very safe place to be. And certainly in some circumstances, safer than being in the community where there might not be as much attention to the mitigation strategies. So while it is a personal decision, everybody has to consider their own personal risk. We know we can operate school very safely with mitigation strategies in place and vaccination is now a mitigation strategy that we have to reduce the chances of infection in our community and in our schools. Thank you. Um, here's one that says, if my kid gets COVID-19 and they're saying Delta variant or, or other, um, are there any long-term effects we know about like we've been seeing in adults? Dr. Newland? Oh, I mean, we don't know. I, I mean, I think, I, I think as Dr. Orsel mentioned earlier, right now the Delta variant looks just like the original or the alpha, you know, the original COVID-19. So I think right now we assume that, you know, there are, again, rare, I think, what was this, uh, low risk, but not no risk, but low yeah. risk. I think that <laughs> plays out here. I mean, I think that's, thing. so yes, there could be potential complications, but it's, it's, it's still rare. Um, but you know, vaccines, thankfully we have the vaccines and if they're of that age and that, you know, that will protect. And again, we also know some of the strategies to help um, obviously prevent getting back, you know, getting COVID-19 with our masking and distancing and such. Thank you. And then uh, Dr. Orson, this one's coming back to you and it may be similar to the previous question you, you uh, just answered, but just to make sure, uh, if I do have my child vaccinated, how do I navigate that child being around younger siblings who aren't? Well, that is a really important thing to do, to have any child who's eligible 
for vaccination, they then have that layer of protection. They're protected if their siblings get infected, and they're much less likely to bring the infection home to their siblings. And so it's really a bi-directional uh, uh, protection that's provided by a child and a family member being vaccinated. We kind of almost call it ring vaccination or cocooning when we vaccinate the people around those who are still susceptible. And it's really a powerful thing for preventing the spread of infection. Dr. Newland, this is a bit of a, again, I, I, I'm wondering about the look you're going to give me when I ask this, but it is an interesting way to phrase the question. Should anyone not get the vaccine? Um, I mean, there are contraindications. There's a couple of, uh, you know, if you're allergic to polyethylene glycol is the one, I think, true contraindication if because that has been shown to have anaphylaxis. Um, I think that's with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. I don't think, but you could get and Johnson, I don't think, I, I don't believe they have the uh, allergic thing. So, I mean, for the most part, there, you know, uh, only thing is if you've had an allergy to one, and maybe if you have a severe allergy when you receive the first vaccine, again, rare complication, you're not going to get the second vaccine, um, second dose, if it's Moderna, Johnson, Johnson. But no, uh, really, no. I don't know, Dr. Orslan, am I, am I missing any other, the potential definitive contraindication i don't believe no, it's an allergy to a vaccine component yes, a serious yes. allergy to the vaccine component severe allergic reaction to a vaccine would be the one you didn't want to get that vaccine in particular but potentially yep. could use a different platform yep and polyethylene glycol is the, only, is the one they mentioned the most i think with pfizer and moderna so but that's i i would like to say i mean that's the beauty of the science that's being done um yeah. is there are different vaccines being developed and have been developed, and there's more coming. I mean, I think that's the beauty. There's an intranasal vaccine that is being developed. I mean, I, this there there will be even more coming down. I, I don't want to say that so that you guys are like, oh, I'll just wait for the one I like. <laughs> Let's not do that. But just so you know, the the it's the technology and the things being used will only get better. And I think we're going to have to. I'm just I, I personally think we're going to have to. Uh, we had we've had a couple questions come in. Um, a parent who is talking about their, their kid has a known heart condition and they're asking, you know, they're saying, should they get the vaccine? I, I think maybe what should they be thinking about as they make that make that decision? Um, it says, you know, they're pushing to talk to their cardiologist, but, you know, just just interesting. Um, what what did, what advice can you impart? Well, I would say any child with any underlying medical condition would be a high priority for receiving the vaccination. We know the complications, cardiac and otherwise, of the infection are much higher, much greater um, than with the vaccine, where we do see a self-limited minor um, a, or a self-limited condition rarely in children. So I would definitely say, obviously, talk to your healthcare provider when you're making a choice about a vaccine for your child. But generally speaking, we would say for children particularly those with underlying health conditions, we would strongly advocate for vaccination. Thank you. Um, let me see here, where's this one? Does the vaccine for a 12 year old or eventually someone younger have the same dosage as an adult? This uh, this person is suggesting that, that just doesn't seem right to them. So um, it's not actually. Um, it's So the, the dose has, it came out, the Pfizer, I think it, it definitely was found that they're going to use a less dose. I think it's half what the dose has been given for the 12 and up. Um, I can tell you for sure the Moderna dose is, is going to be half of what they've given um, for the um, older groups. That's what it looks like. And this is based on the studies knowing that the, the immunogenicity, so your immune system response when they do the blood work in the trials, show that, but the actual adverse events were higher with the higher dose in these younger children. So yeah, so the dosing is less, but but the important thing is, I think that we're going to see that the, well, and we will learn that, you know, whether how effective it is when they, when they, when we finally learn about the randomized trial, which is as they're doing currently. But I, but I would suspect it's going to be a, a less dose for sure in this age group. Uh, we're going to do one more, and then we're going to kind of go to some closing thoughts here, and got to give the people what they want. The the, the questions uh, keep coming in on on masking, and I, I know we we want to kind of stick, uh, you know, put a pin in that for for a little bit. But I mean, one of them is, you know, some schools have said that they will not require unvaccinated students to wear masks, and people are just generally concerned about, you know, what that could look like in terms of spread for students and families, et cetera. So. 
um, any, any thoughts that you you are able to to provide people with, or any any peace of mind or, or general guidance? Well, I can start. You know, we know that the vaccines are very effective. Um, we know that masks are very effective, and the CDC has said in certain circumstances that people who are vaccinated can go unmasked. Now, it may become a legit, or sorry, people who are vaccinated in certain circumstances can go unmasked. Um, it can become a logistical implementation problem for different institutions about whether they are going to be able to reliably keep unvaccinated students safe, whether they're going to be able to reliably track a family preference for mask usage in a child, whether they're going to be able to re reliably enforce that. So, um, you know, is something safe? Is something able to be implemented in a safe way? I think that's the question. Uh, I, I just go back to the fact that what we have learned um, in the six how many months we are we on this now guys like 16 17 months into this pandemic um what we have learned is one of the most effective strategies in preventing covid 19 transmission is mass um in in all the different settings that we have used them it just it just stops transmission it's really remarkable i mean i think you know dr orson and i can tell you and mike and Everybody that works up here, you know, we're we have a vaccination rate in the 90 plus percent, and that eventually it's going to be as close to 100 percent as you possibly can get. Um, we still wear masks. We still wear masks. It's okay. Now we have smaller groups where we might not be masked all the time, but when we walk around and we're around group bigger groups, we wear masks because we know it just works. And I think in the setting currently that we're dealing with, I think that's what we have to take into account. We, you cannot underestimate what is going on currently in Southwest Missouri and the fact we're seeing the similar trends right here in our backyard. I mean, I'd say Missouri, I'd say Springfield's our backyard, but right here in our own front door. It's right here, guys. Um, so mass work, just remember that. I mean, you might not like them, and I get it, right? Like, it's been annoying, and you die, my nose hurts, my, but they work, and they especially work when we're seeing what we're seeing now. And any death right now, for the most part, with vaccination, many would say that's a preventable death. That's a preventable death, not only because of vaccine, because we have masks, we know how to do this. So that, that's what I think, and we ha we have to continue to remember what what has worked. Yeah, we had uh, we had we had one question come in, and, and we won't necessarily address it, but they might have missed or joined late. But they were they were asking about the the, the, the new cases and the hospitalizations. Are they ticking up? Or are they down? And I, I think. Um, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what I read today is that the, the state reported its highest new case levels since mid-January today. And, and yeah, hospitalizations and, and patients in intensive care units are both ticking up in the state. So yeah, it's a, it's a challenge right now for sure. Definitely. I think we all want this pandemic to be over, but the message is it's not over. But the good news in this story is that we've learned how to do school effectively. We know what we can do to um, get, get kids back to school safely. We know now have a very effective tool called vaccination that will provide an additional layer of protection. We can do this. The most important thing is having children not have disruption in their educational process by developing an infection, by needing to quarantine. And we have the tools at hand to accomplish that. Well, I uh, I may have just inadvertently teed you up for closing remarks, but uh, do either of you have uh, anything you want to you want to leave our our viewers with this evening as we get ready to sign off? Uh, uh, thank you for watching, listening. Um, we're here to support. We know many of you are on the fence. Uh, many of you might be still saying, "Look, I don't. I'm not doing it. I'm not getting the vaccine." Just know that we care. We'll always care about you, your families, your children. Yeah, we're passionate about getting vaccines, um, but we're there for you. We'll always will be here. Our, you know, the the community is here as we've been the whole time. Um, and you have more questions, ask. Um, we believe in the vaccines, and as more stuff comes, we'll let you know. But you know, the more we can get people vaccinated, the less likely we're going to see what they're seeing down in uh, Springfield area. Absolutely. And, you know, Jason mentioned his children who are vaccinated. I certainly looked at the data very carefully as I was thinking about vaccination for my ch my children um, and, you know, obviously elected to have them vaccinated. And, you know, that's really provided peace of mind for me and for my family, um, both in our own household. But when we, you know, meet with family members who may be more vulnerable, um, we have provided this layer of protection both for the children and for our larger family and community. Well, thank you both for taking the time 
uh, tonight to, to, to share your, I, I'm going to call it wisdom because I believe that it is, um, certainly your expertise. Um, but uh, no, I, I'm sure very much appreciated by the viewers. Um, I am glad that I did not have myself on mute for the sign off, uh, but uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for all the questions. Um, please do continue to take advantage of St. Louis Children's Hospital as a resource. Keep sending us your questions. Uh, we will do our best to get back to you directly. Uh, but again, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you for, for viewing. Thank you to Dr. Orsland, Dr. Newland, and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Good night.